All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate you giving up some time on this Monday evening. Uh, we are focusing this town hall on the new high school diploma. Um, just to give some information, give some background, allow people the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so thank you again for giving up your little bit of time. Obviously, as we, this is focused on our young people, and we want to make sure that our young people receive the best education that they can to get them ready for a life as productive adults. Um, as an introduction, my name is Earl Harris, Jr., the state representative in House District 2. I represent almost all of East Chicago, except for one precinct that Representative Jackson uh, rep is the representative for. Um, I'll be moderating tonight's conversation. We have, I want to introduce, we have three of our wonderful State House staff, Emily, Christian, and Courtney. So if you did not um, sign in, please sign in. We also have some information on the diploma, and there are some index cards if you'd like to ask questions, because we will open it up for the questions. Uh, and if you at any point during the panel discussion here, uh, if you need anything, just raise your hand, and one of the three of them will be happy to help you. So thank you for joining us, um, and we appreciate this. And thank them for driving up from Indianapolis and drive safely when you head back later on. Uh, what I want to do, actually, if we can start off, just give everyone up here as members of the panel. We're joined by a couple of other legislators, Senator Lonnie Randolph, who represents all of East Chicago on the Senate side, and as I mentioned, Representative Jackson, and then we have a couple of our local education gurus. Um, so if Senator Randolph, you wouldn't mind introducing yourself first. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name's Lonnie Randolph, uh, State Center, 2nd District. I represent the city of East Chicago, city of Hammond, Whiting, and Munster, and everything. And I'm very happy to be here. This is a very important topic, one that uh, we're trying to ourselves understand how it works. Matter of fact, there's no finalization as, as of yet, so it's going to be able to be involving and changing and everything. So hopefully, we'll, uh, before, I, before I finish saying any further, I, I get long-winded sometimes. I'm going to have to leave early because I've got another speaking engagement I have to go to in Sherville and everything. But this is our leader, so he's going to cover everything. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right, Representative Jackson. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I'm Representative Carolyn Jackson. I represent District 1, which is all of Whiting, and uh, most of uh, Hammond up to the west, including the west side of, of um, Kennedy Avenue. And from there on, uh, Representative Harris um, represents the other part of Hammond, which was Hessville. And I uh, also have just a small portion of East Chicago, which is um, Roxana. So I'm very pleased to be here uh, and to engage in the conversation. I serve on Environment, Human, hum, and, and Children and Human Affairs Committee, as well as Natural Resources. We, we have been... Um, discussing this issue with education for six to seven months now, and it is ever-changing. We are not here to give you the final bit of information, but just to bring you up to date as to where things stand now. So thank you so much. Do you mind giving your other, I'll ask you to do this too, give your other leadership positions? Sure. I serve as um, assistant uh, minority work for the Democratic Caucus, as yeah. well as uh, Assistant Chairman for the IBLC. And Senator Randolph, you don't Yeah, I'm the Minority Whip in the Senate. Uh, I serve on the Judiciary Committee, which I'm the ranking member for that, on the Appropriations Committee, as uh, well as on the, uh, what else I suppose, the Insurance Committee. And um, there's one other committee, which I'll think of in a minute. <laughs> um, but in any event, um, uh, it's, um, we, are, we are very few, by that I mean in the Senate, you've got 50 senators of which you've only got uh, 10, okay, who are Democrats. And as a result of that, they put us on several committees, sometimes without even notification at all concerning that. And so it's a situation where, well, as, as we talk, maybe some of the information will come out to help educate you concerning the process and responsibilities that we have down there in Indianapolis, okay? And I'm cut it short. <laughs> okay. Superintendent. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Stephen Bournet, proud superintendent of the School City of East Chicago. Um, this obviously is my first year with the School City. 
um, but I bring over 30 years of experience at all levels, K-12, especially with high school, having been a high school educator for 13 and um, school superintendent for Illinois of a high school district, uh, where we were charged with looking at how we support graduation requirements and how we support the increasing of graduation requirements to make sure that our students are nationally and locally competitive. Looking forward to sharing our insights on how we can make this implementation of the new diploma for the state successful and truly um, benefit our students. All right. Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Dorothy Frank. I'm the interim vice chancellor for student affairs and enrollment management at Indiana University Northwest. Um, I've been in higher education for over 30 years. My primary um, role has been in enrollment. At IU Northwest, I'm considered the enrollment officer for our campus, and I also um, am with K-12 um, initiatives, K through 12, peak through, we said K through 12 initiatives, mm -hmm. uh, so pre-college. And so I will also say that I was in education when we went to Core 40. <laughs> and so I was telling my friend here how um, when we started the Core 40 diploma, how we lacked in communication and getting that through and working it out with all of the high schools and the colleges. And so I'm excited to be here in this conversation to hear what you have to say and your questions. And with me tonight, I brought the team from a few of my team members from IU Northwest. Um, we have a person here that does two people for K-12 initiatives and our director of enrollment uh, with us tonight. Thank you. And then a um, little information about myself. I mentioned Earl Harris, State Representative, House District 2. I serve, um, I, I, the district encompasses almost all of East Chicago, as mentioned earlier, except for one precinct, uh, Hessville and Hammond, and then part of Gary. And then I also, in terms of other positions, um, I serve as the Assistant Floor Leader for the House Democrats, and also am the Chair of the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus, as Representative Jackson mentioned, she is the Vice Chair. And then on the national level, I serve as the vice chair of the Board of Latino Legislative Leaders, which is made up of Latino legislators throughout the country. So glad to be here with you. Um, proud resident of East Chicago, born and raised here. I'm glad to be here. So the goal tonight is really to get into facts about the diploma proposal, answer questions as best we can, and also let you know how you can be involved. Um, I mentioned being the chair of the Black Caucus, we do, town halls all over the state after session is over and I can tell you one of the things we are the topic we heard most about at the Black Caucus town halls was about the diploma in fact the first version was released right before Elkhart town hall and we have we go over legislation we spend about 45 minutes to an hour and then open up to questions 100% of the questions and comments that were made from the audience was about the new diploma so what it meant to us is there was a lot of people who had questions and concerns, because mostly those questions were questions that related to concerns. So there's been a lot of work done on this. Um, to give a little bit of background, during the 2023 legislative session, House Enact um, Bill 1002 established work-based work, work -based learning throughout Indiana high schools. This year, the legislature passed House and Act 1243, which tasked the Indiana Department of Education with creating work-based learning diplomas. Earlier this summer, the State Board of Education released an initial diploma called the GPS and GPS Plus. This is what I talked about was released right before the Elkhart Town Hall. Um, I was one of the people that testified at a meeting at the end of July, which was the end of the first period of comments for the first diploma and spoke about some of the concerns that I and others had about the diploma. Um, there was a lot of, I'll be honest with you, there was a lot of backlash that happened. In fact, the universities, I read a little bit of the letter from Purdue, the universities all came out in not supporting the new diploma at all as it originally was introduced. Basically, letting everyone know that it did not fit the rigor and that students would graduate from Indiana schools, and this starts in 2029, that students would graduate and not qualify to go to Indiana or universities in Indiana. Now let that sink in. Your student lives here in Indiana, graduated, wanted to go to IU, Purdue, Ivy Tech, etc. They all came out and said it does not fit 
the qualifications. Your students will not fit the qualifications. So there was a, some changes made. Um, there was a new version that was released on August 4th. The State Board of, I'm sorry, August 14th. 14th. The State Board of Education has not yet made the full draft rule available to the public. Uh, we're waiting for that to happen, and then they have not, as of yet, opened up to public comment, so presuming they'll do the same thing they did with the first version, is there'll be an opportunity for people to make public comment. Um, if you haven't picked up, I saw a couple of people walk in. Um, again, if you haven't signed up, there are also cards for questions, and then we have information on the, the second version of the diploma, so you can take a look. Um, I know I had a conversation with Commission for Higher Ed last week just to see where they were because again all the universities and everyone was not happy with the initial version that came out. CHE expressed they feel better about this. They are accepting of it, kind of like with an asterisk, waiting for the final rule to come out whether they openly say they were in acceptance of it or not and then the universities have come out pretty much with the same thing. So we're all kind of in a hold mode to see how this plays out. Um, but again the open session has not, uh, op opportunity for public comment has not opened up yet. That does not mean though that you cannot reach out to the State Board of Education. So if you are going through this and looking at it and have comments, I would say reach out to State Board of Education. Let them know about your concerns. Even if officially that hasn't opened up yet, there's nothing wrong with you as parents, teachers, community people voicing your, uh, your opinion on this. So we're gonna kind of dive in here and I really want to when I do town halls and things like this, um, and I, I, I believe everyone up here also, if anyone has any comment they want to make, let me actually go there first. Does anyone have anything they want to add before I? Oh, I do. okay. Representative Yes, I, I just wanted to add, today I had a meeting with the uh, Catholic bishops of uh, Archdiocese over in Maryville, and I brought this information to them about the Honors Program um, and the Honors Plus. <clears throat> and ask them what was their feelings about it. Because let's face it, a lot of the students here in our area, they attend Calumet College. Calumet College is a Catholic college, and it is a school that is close by. Not to mention many students have aspirations to go to Notre Dame, which is an excellent school. My question is, hey, what, what, what are your feelings about this? And I got the blank stare because they didn't have a clue. They did not know that the educational requirements to graduate from high school are on the table to be changed. And they don't know where they're gonna start. They, they don't have a clue. And I explained to them, based upon the information that I have received, it's gonna start in January with the seventh graders. So they had to go, they, they have to, had to take that information and I have to provide them with additional information so that they basically can go back and start asking questions because they were not brought to the table. But what really um, kind of disturbed me a little bit, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but they informed me that due to the voucher program, and as you all know, the voucher program takes funds away from the public schools. They informed me that just this last what, three weeks, four weeks, however long school has been in session, that they have got an increase of 6% in, in, uh, in school um, attendance, I mean school registration. And that's just the few schools, Bishop Noel, um, Andrean, and I think yeah. it's another one. And I think that that's significant because that is where a lot of the funds are going to the reason why our public schools are, f are falling behind when it comes to educating our uh, majority of our children. Yeah, resources. You know. Exactly. And, that, and that's a key issue concerning that. Indiana, we have a state constitution, and all of those states have one as well, concerning education. There's really a separation of state and, 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 and city anyway and everything. But, and it's always violated in Indiana because the majority, they got the numbers. But um, when you talk about money distribution, our obligation as legislators is supposed to look out for the public schools, first and foremost. But what's been happening over a period of time, that responsibility has been eroded. 
You wrote it because of special interest groups saying that we want charters because charters are better in terms of public schools, or we want private schools to have an interest. That's where vouchers come in at. But we find out the numbers in terms of the charter schools now are in most cases worse than the public schools, okay? And not that much better at all. In terms of the vouchers, what's happening with the vouchers, private schools, that they're taking away the residents, the students from the public schools and going to the private schools, which means the funding, because it's a per student funding, is being lost by the public schools. So then they complain about the public schools saying, we want you to do better. Well, how can we do better when you're taking all our resources and giving them to the vouchers and giving them to the charter schools? And now we pass a law that's saying that public schools can do referendums. It should, it's unfair for them to do that for extra funds. We can do referendums. But in addition to that, now the referendums that public schools have to do, we have to share it with charter schools. We have to share it with charter schools. So in other words, you do the work, but they get part of the benefits and don't do no work at all. I don't know. There's an unfairness about that. And the unfairness comes because we don't have the numbers. And we don't have the numbers because voters like you don't come out and vote and put people like you that focus on your interests and in positions. So, I mean, I, I'm not here to criticize or chastise, but I'm just saying those are the facts. And uh, we're at a disadvantage, and we fight as hard as we can. And I'm not on the Educational Committee. I'm on the Tax Committee. That's the other committee I forgot to mention. That's the most important committee. That should be number one and everything. So when issues concerning taxes come up, then I hear that in terms of my committee and everything. Uh, I'm only about, what, three Democrats out of about 13 that's on the committee and everything, maybe four. And uh, it's tough. It's tough and everything. And like I said, uh, uh, we, we follow the Camilla Harris model, okay? We fight like, we, no, we fight like hell, excuse my language. Uh, and, and sometimes we win. And sometimes we win even though you think we're losing because what happens is that we, we argue bills that's going to have a negative effect on us, particularly public schools. And sometimes the negative effect could be tenfold. But we argue to the point where we might end up decreasing that to fivefold, threefold. So we minimize the negative effect that we'll have on public schools and everything. So this could have been worse, okay? <laughs> but uh, in any event, let me, I'm through. No, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> if I neglected to say, the new diplomas will take effect with the class of 2029. So that's something to keep in mind um, as we're moving through this process. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is, is when I spoke against this, or not spoke against this, shared concerns. How many of you know about 21st century scholars? All right, 21st century scholars provides funding for you, your students, your young people, to go to college. Um, previously, and it was created under the Evan Bayh when he was governor, um, and what you saw here with a minimal amount of people raising their hands I know, and I'm not the only person that can tell this story, is someone would come and say, hey, my, my kid's a junior, they want to go to college. Do you have any ideas of how to pay for college? And I'd ask, are they a 21st century scholar kid, student? And the answer would be, what's that? And so um, in 23, I authored legislation that became a law that made uh, 21st century scholars automatic enrollment. So even if you don't know that you will qualify for 21st century scholars, you qualify. And so the funding is there. One of the things I said when I spoke at the public comment was the diploma as it was in this original version basically took away the need for 21st century scholars because our students could not go to college. So uh, this is something that's big. I worked in public education for a long time, so public education is big for me. Uh, what I was starting to say before is I like to, when I do town halls, have it open more to questions as opposed to us just talking. So I, we may have a question or two already. If you have a question, raise your hand and um, Christian or Courtney will grab your question and add, and we can answer it. Yeah, if anyone has a note card, they fill out. <clears throat> um, maybe we should give them the. Um, yeah, So the question is, are the relationships going to be developed to ensure jobs for graduating seniors? And what does that process look like? Um, I'll answer the second part 
first, which is we don't know. Yeah. And that's, you're going to find a lot of that's going to be comments that we're going to make is we don't know because there's still a lot of questions that we have and that people have about this. Um, and the first part are the relationships going to be developed to ensure jobs for graduating seniors. Students, so just a little bit of background in case you don't know, students will actually be sent out to work at businesses. That's the big push for workforce. So instead of them being in classroom, they're going to be sent out to work. So to some degree, those relationships can get established, but your students are going to be um, basically free labor while they're in high school. So that's not necessarily the best type of situation for our young people. Um, I, I'm going to get into some other things, but I want to make sure we hit questions first. So any other questions? Representative Harris, may I add one more thing? Yeah, please. So one of the the keys to this being and keep in mind i'll try to be as remain neutral as possible but i know at the end of the day how successful this is is going to be how we're measured as a district and so it's going to always come back to um, what efforts we've done to make this successful it's going to rely in how it's implemented so in order for you to be successful there are some relationships that have to be cultivated and partnerships that have to be established so that we have all of these opportunities for our students, for the students who want to get their basic 100 hours or the students who want to seal and want to get 1,600 hours. And so all of that has to be careful conversations we're having to see where all those opportunities are going to be. That's the issue. I'm, I'm not the educator in my family. I'm not on the educational committee. Just some basic fundamental things I think of mm -hmm. about this situation. When you focus on a new curriculum dealing with shifting toward job orientation for high school students, you've got a lot of things that, that's, that they have to put together now. Well, you focus on it. That means that someone's going to have to be in charge of contacting industries within the, within the area, with the cities of town. Mm -hmm. What industries have, and which means someone's going to have to be in charge of finding out what their needs are. And then if, in fact, you've got a majority of an area that's needs focused on one particular area, does that mean that they're going to have influence over the administration, the educational part, to shift the learning toward what their need is, neglecting other industries and neglecting other objectives that other students might have? Then you've got the additional cost factor, too. Who's going to pay for that? Okay? Then you also got the factor, too, that if, in fact, you put a place a student in an industry, and the student gets hurt, who's going to be liable? Absolutely. Who's going to pay the, inj the injuries? Who's going to pay for medicals? I mean, that's not cheap, okay? So these are a lot of unanswered questions that the Indiana Department of Education don't know, but yet they want to implement rules that you have to abide by, and you don't even know what the rules are because right. they don't know what the rules are. Right. So how are we going to get through this? I don't know. Why the reason exists for the change, no one knows. Exactly. When you make a change, you make a change for the better. Not just make it because of the heck of it, because you feel like doing it. You recognize there's a problem, then you make the change to try to address that problem. We didn't come up with a problem, but yet they made the change. And they made the change because they felt like doing it, and they had the majority, and there's nothing we can do about it. Because they have, they have a quorum. A quorum means you two-thirds, all they need is the House and the Senate to, to pass legislation. At one time, we had a situation where we, by we, I mean the, the, the Democrats, minorities, particularly in the House, they had to be part of the quorum when they had the workforce issue concerning the right-to-work issue bill. At that time, Pat Bauer was the Speaker of the House at that time, and what occurred was that they wanted to make an extreme measure in terms of his right-to-work bill. They wanted to push it down everybody's throat. Well, well Steve Bauer, well, Pat Bauer said, okay, we won't let you make a quorum, and that means you can't pass the law. And they said, if you do, we'll arrest you, because the governor can order the legislator to be arrested. Right. Okay, if he's so Pat said, okay, as a speaker, we're going to go out of the jurisdiction, and we're going to go to Illinois. And they went to Springfield, so they couldn't make a quorum. So as a result, he was in a bargaining position to try to minimize the damage that that law has and everything. We're not in that position now. We can walk out in the Senate today and they can say bye bye and they can still pass legislation because exactly. we don't need them to make a quorum and everything. Same thing in the House. Right. And that's another reason why it's important that people participate in the voting process so that we can try to make it even because it's cheating you. 
because when you when you have an one-sided, lopsided legislation that passes what they want, you don't have a, a debate on the merits of the bills to strengthen the bill for your benefit. When you have two different sides, they make up the pros and cons they argue for, and they come up with the best solution. That means that everybody agrees what's in your best interest. But if you just got one, and they make the numbers, they do what they feel like doing, whether it benefits you or not. They don't care, okay? And I'm talking too much now. Yeah, but, anyway. but, but, the, but, that, but what you're saying is actually true and correct. And as a parent, I would be concerned <clears throat> because if my daughter or my son had to do X amount of hours across town, how are they going to get there if I'm at work and their dad, my husband, is at work as well? How are they going to get there and get back? Also, what I also have to bring in there, we passed legislation this past session that said that children could work, children up 16 years old could work, I think, up to 40-some hours, which means they could, a week, which is up to like uh, 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So that means if they're in this program, this proposed program, that they could be or have to be across town and they could do this work, whatever this assignment was, until 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Now, you know, in our area, we don't have a lot of uh, transportation, bus transportation, et cetera, to get uh, uh, our sales back and forth. We rely on private vehicles, okay? So what is going to happen with this child who has to go back and forth every week or however um, it's determined in order to meet these uh, requirements? The other thing is rural areas. I grant you we are not a rural, in a rural situation here, but how are these children who live on farms, who, who, who commute to school on a bus, and at 3.30 or 4 o'clock when school is out, that bus drops those students off. And if your child is not on the bus, they're out of luck. Where are they going to go to get a job? And I'm telling you, a lot of these rural areas, I don't know if you've been to a lot of these rural areas, but I have. It's nothing there. They don't even have the necessary health care close by. So how is this child going to get here in order to satisfy the requirements to get their diploma. You see, these things were put in place in a rush. Things were not thought out. Somebody got a bright idea and put some things quickly on a piece of paper and thought it was going to fly. But we retaliated. Okay? We let them know it's not going to work, we're not happy, and something needs to be done about it. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about we as Democrats, but <laughs> I heard today that the Republicans don't like it too. <laughs> so with that happening, this is our opportunity to allow our voices to be heard, to say what it is that we want and we don't want. Because the reality is, I, I, and I just have to, I have to say it and then I'm going to be quiet. You got people who are nowhere near in the educational field. Nowhere. They don't have a clue. Who come up with these bright ideas because they feel that this is something that should be done because maybe it's something that could help incentivize somebody in their community. But it's something that is detrimental. They try something di different. Every year, I've been in the General Assembly, this is my sixth year, and every year it is something new that comes about to further dismantle education. That's why we have to stand up. We have to allow our voices to be heard. If that means that we have to come and stand there and let them be heard while their, their meetings are going on, that we aren't going to take it anymore. Before I get to the next question, any other comments from the panel? Go ahead. Oh, uh, just the idea that there is this funding question. So are we going to be required to implement 
and sustain without any appropriate funding the additional resources. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but yes. And we have challenges already with making sure that no. students have apprenticeships now. No. no. So those are going to be magnified, which is why. That, yeah, absolutely. Just like what happened a couple of years ago when they changed when they changed with this new reading program or whatever. There was no additional funds. I can't that tell has. you how many That's schools it. stood up and told me that they had already paid for curriculums and they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because they had paid for these curriculums that would afford their whole district the opportunity to learn and when it changed they were stuck they had contracts they could not get out of and then they had to spend additional money to switch to something else so the answer is no yeah. If I can mention one, of, and this is on your paperwork, and you can you can add to this. There's a stat on here about our the count. Here it is. Uh, Indiana has the worst counselor to student ratio in the nat nation mm -hmm. at 694 to one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So imagine the additional need for counselors, yeah. which is not there. And I know we have some school board members and other mm -hmm. educators in the yeah. in the yeah. room as well. That's another part of that financial and, and issue. This is going to be a, an additional burden for the counseling staff. <laughs> yeah. To Absolutely. keep track of yes. all of the, the hours, yeah. to keep track of either by person or program yeah. or resource, how is that going to be managed? Yeah. And that's one of the questions that has not come up. Dr. Frank, you would like to add something? No, I was going to echo that. Mm -hmm. The managing that, even on the college side, on the different requirements that the schools may, the high schools will have for their students to graduate. Well, let me just say the options of courses that are available. Right. I looked at the, all of the courses that are available in math because when we go through um, this requirement here, we will look to see how, how students met this requirement. And this is what we did with the core 40, right? Yeah. This will put a burden on us if every high school is a little different, right? And so where are we going to have commonality in the high school diploma like we did with core 40? Core 40 was straightforward. This is what you see here is what we looked at. When we come over here and we go to seven credits of uh, personal, four additional math right. credits, mm -hmm. we're gonna be looking at what are those four additional math credits right. that are going to be beneficial for your students or your son or daughter uh, to be successful in college. So we're, we're looking at it from that standpoint. When we look at, we do not take lightly the employment portion of this. We understand that there are some concerns and issues for this. I will say that our team, uh, like I said, I have our, our team here in the room today. We have uh, programs, the academic pathway programs, mm -hmm. to try to help with some of those experiences. Sure. And so I think that once we have a community of people like yourself and, and myself sitting around the table to talk about, okay, here's the requirement. Now, how are we going to help get there, right? So in December, we, we shall know what the next iteration of this will be. Um, but then how are we going to help you get to this to make sure that your students are ready for college uh, so that they can they can complete successfully? Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I also, let me add, if I may, please. Yeah, and I need to get some questions. When it comes to education, school-wise, the most important individual is the individual in the classroom, mm -hmm. the teachers. Mm -hmm. But yet... For some reason, they're always left out when it comes to decision making concerning the direction of education. Why, I don't know. So we're going to have to start shifting our focus a little bit and start recognizing the, the important roles that teachers play. The other thing, too, is when you make changes like this, the school boards are very important. They're the ones that set the guidelines, the procedures, the rules, and regulations and everything. And they're also the ones that come up with the budget. So, I mean, you set a budget. We changed the laws, education-wise. Now you've already made a commitment concerning your budget. You're going to be short of money. Mm -hmm. And when you're short of money, you're going to look for it. The state, the state will say, well, do a referendum. Well, you do a referendum, what do you got to do? You do a referendum that raises a, a million dollars, but $400,000 have to go to charter schools. <laughs> so, so you see how it goes back and affects you one way or another. So you got to do a lot of thinking, a lot of strategizing. And these things are important because it, it, it wakes you up in terms of the reason why you have to get involved with local issues that you don't think directly affects you, and it does. So, 
we're going to um, go on to questions. I do want to add in, I know I mentioned that this is the class of 2029 will be impacted by this, um, and, and Representative Jackson talked about how this is rushed. The deadline for State Board of Education to have the new diploma structure in place is the 31st of December of this year. So that's not a lot of time. And then in terms of it not being a lot of time to get this finalized, it also does not give, and I know we have a superintendent, we have some board and other education people in there, that does not give you a lot of time to get ready for the next school year on top of everything that the school year is involved. All right, I want to get to questions. As a reminder, if you have questions, um, Christian and Courtney can help you with cards. This is a great question. You need to go. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So I've got to go to uh, Are the another speaker. Are questions by card? Uh, yes. Or will we be able to? By card. Okay, so. uh, the question is, are there any exceptions in the proposal of the 650 work-based hours for student athletes on the path for a sports scholarship? Seems like a lot to balance for a student. Does anyone else want to dive in on that, or should I answer? We have a discussed exception yet, so that so yeah. right now yeah. we have just what's in black and white. Correct. But yeah. those those are the things that we say. Have we thought about this? <laughs> have we thought about that? I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. There's nothing that we've seen that has anything to do with if you are a student athlete, you get some sort of exception in terms of time. Your plate's already full, and you'll just have to, at this point, figure it out. We hope, again, that was, these are some of the things that have changed. Also, as we talk about issues here, remember, these are things you can express for public comment back and say, hey, what about student athletes? We have a lot of athletes that are working on scholarships that will help get them into college. What about those opportunities? How does that play out? So please keep that in mind um, as we continue down this process. Uh, next question is, when a student comes to school, they are our babies. The student must need a ride to work. A student must have knowledge of the work that they will be doing. The question is, how do the unions feel having students working at union companies? You know, that's a good question. I actually, right after the first um, diploma came out, I don't know if anybody else want to add to it. After the first option came out, I was actually at an event involving union and had this conversation with one of our union leaders here in Northwest Indiana, and he was honest about having an issue with this. He's like, this doesn't really make sense to me in terms of the structure of this, in terms of how it works. You know, the other thing I don't think we've talked about, Representative Jackson brought up, what about our, and this doesn't really impact us, what about the rural parts of the state because where do they go? The other side of that is companies don't have to accept students. There's nothing mandating them. They can't be mandated to accept students. So we don't know what kind of options are going to be there. And you know, bringing up unions, they may have a potential issue. I don't think they've really spoken out broadly about this, but I'm going to presume our union members have an issue with this. The other part is, if you are a company owner or you're a worker, you're now going to be responsible for a student. A minor. So, yeah, minor. So <laughs> a minor. A minor. that's something that I, um, I'm sure is also a concern. The other thing is, we talked about, uh, Representative, thank you. A few more, sorry. Good, that's great. Representative Jackson talked a little bit about, you know, the, and, and Senator Randolph talked about the whole liability and safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's something that, you know, in terms of background checks. So when you're sending your 16 year old son or daughter to a workplace, background checks are not required. So mm -hmm. whom are you sending them to work with? So these are some of the other concerns that we have expressed. And I, I want to say something about the, sure. the athletes, because this is an example of communicating. Yeah. So if the athlete is going to college, then they should be on the enrollment path. And so they, a lot of counseling needs to happen in conversations because you wouldn't want that the student to be on the employment path or the enlistment service path seal if they're intending to go to college. And so that's going to be a conversation to have. Um, and so we'll, and I know our team has already started to think about because students can change their mind. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so, you know, they start out and now they want to go to college, but they went on the employment track. And so uh, the team has started to think about how do we convert all of this to have it fit in the, in the employment, the enrollment seal. And you just brought up something. You start on a path, what if you change? Yeah. I can tell you my own college experience. I changed right. ideas right. Right. <laughs> and right. changed right. universities based on what I wanted to do. Absolutely. 
Um, so this is more of comments versus question, and they brought this person brought up issues. Child labor laws, Representative Jackson talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Union busting, which is always in the background when you talk about labor and bringing more people into there. I know that was connected to the previous question. Um, funding has already been discussed, um, and especially the K-12s. How is this going to be funded? It looks like an effort to cause failure of our public education system. That is a great comment. Um, there's some things, and I'm not trying to get too partisan on this, but as Representative Jackson said, it, this is not just a Democrat thing. There are Republicans that are not overly enthused about this as well. Um, you know, public schools still are the biggest educators of our students, so we need to make sure that they are protected. And then uh, the last comment this person makes is, most interest, industries we require students to be 18 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another issue in terms of how are those numbers going to work out? How's the 16, 17 year old? I graduated high school when I was 17. If this was the case, I would have never reached the age to do this. <laughs> Does anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, to I mean, it's so true. I graduated at 17 too. And uh, I can remember my first job was as, um, as a typist in, uh, in downtown Chicago. And I can just reflect back on things that happened to me that I didn't have a clue about. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're 17 years old, you the maturity just is not there. Not. And um, we're talking about children who are 15, 16 years old in environment with in environments with adults. Absolutely. I mean, just to come in this school, if I were volunteering or if I was coming <clears> here <throat> to do something. I would have to fill out a, a, a form so that you all could do a background check. Yes. But if I'm sending my child, my pet, my precious baby, to work over here because it's a requirement, there's nothing saying that a background check or anything has to be done. They could be working beside anybody who is somebody who could cause my child physical and mental harm and distress. I, you know. There's nothing being said about that. It's you go over here, you do this, and if you got to work 40 hours, et cetera. I can remember working the job, and I remember most 17-year-olds are tired. They, they need a lot of sleep. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you, I remember getting sleepy and putting my head down on that typewriter when I didn't have anything to do, and I went to sleep. And they're like, uh, Carolyn, you can't do that. But at 17, I'm sleepy, and I, I got to go, take a nap right now. But I'm just saying, that's what you have happen, because children just are not to that point as of development where they know and they understand those things. So this, there's some questions directed at Representative Jackson. Um, unfortunately, Senator Randolph has left, so we can't ask him his. I believe the question for you, Representative Jackson, is Catholic schools are private. So, our private schools, so how would it affect, how would overall this GPS, the new GPS grade, if you give me a moment to finish, would affect private and uh, charter, you know, charter schools that aren't a part of the public school system? I mean, I can, we just sat here and we... Well, I can answer that question. Or okay. Representative Jackson, okay. you want to take it or Okay, well... I can it does. It's all, if you are certified with the state of Indiana, doesn't matter if you are if you're a charter school or a private school, you still fit in this. Well, so yeah, they are impacted to, as well. You have to meet certain criteria, but they wouldn't be obligated to follow the same same curriculum exact. They have to follow the new diplomas. They would have to. I had this they conversation. They would have to have similar programs, but not the same. Well, what I was told was they have to follow the same rules as the public schools. Right, and that's what I was told <clears throat> today. That, that they would have to follow the same rules. Legitimate. That's actually not in the Okay, well, I'm telling you what I was told after doing some follow-up on this, and yep. they are also part of this. Yep, I was told the same thing today. Yeah. And then, how would I, something benefit America, I don't know what, I'm sorry, I don't know what your oh, question is. Oh, uh, Randolph, Representative Randolph, you know, kind of threw out Harris, and we're trying to do the whole Harris thing. How would trying to do the, what thing? the whole Harris and Waltz president thing going on right now? What are you the talking presidency? about? I, Lonnie Randolph threw that out there. My question is, since he, threw, he, he brought that up, how would the $6.7 trillion tax hike on America? Okay, cross this is board? not, we're not getting into presidential. This well, is about the diploma, well, and this is a nonpartisan event. Okay. So I understand you wanted 
do what you want to do, but that's not what this is oh, about. No, so I respect your, I thank you for your, yeah. uh, respect you, but this is not what, that's not what this is about. All you have to do is say we didn't want to answer it. That's well, he's not here, so he can't answer it. So. Okay. Right, and we're talking about the, um, we're talking about how the state uh, comes up with the rules and the regulations as to how schools are to be run and how their educational programs is to to happen and that does not uh, affect the federal government. Yeah, this so is the state the board of education. This is state board of education. Right. This is the state, state of Indiana. This is not a federal thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is not the. This is not on the federal level. It's the state doing this. Right. Okay. Uh, the next person put vouchers question mark transportation question mark school board question mark and they wrote too long to write so I'm not sure what the questions are no that's me uh, there was uh, my name's Humberto uh, I've been living in um, Camden for over 20 years um, so I'm represented by uh, Lonnie and represented by Carolyn Jackson mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you guys are aware of the school closures that happened in mm -hmm. Indiana mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. impact that it had on a lot of families uh, I'm blessed that you know I had my kids in the private school uh, sector. Uh, I did have them in the public school sector in the beginning when they were young, but I switched them to the uh, to the private sector, uh, and it kind of benefited me as well. I had to pay for it, um, so I'm getting to the transportation portion. It was mentioned that how are kids going to get from point A to point B? Well, school board just voted to, to close a bunch of schools. Families are now challenged to get their their children from point A to point B. So that was one thing. So I, I guess it's it's all speculation that's being mentioned here, in my opinion. Uh, so the vouchers helped me out uh, when my daughter was in eighth grade. It does pay for your education, privately or publicly. So if a, if a public school is failing you, if it's failing me, if it's failing my children, I as a parent should have the choice to switch them to a successful school, whether it's public or private. Both of my teenagers are in public high school. They're not in private high school. They're in public high school. That's because I chose to put them in that high school because that high school is succeeding. But in the elementary level, it was not succeeding, so I chose private education. The vouchers helped me tremendously when my daughter was in eighth grade. I didn't qualify for the voucher program because of income uh, regulations in the beginning. But if families do qualify for the voucher program and a public school system like in Gary, like in Hammond, is failing them, a parent should have that choice to get their child out of that failing school and choose a better outcome for them. So my question to you guys is, why are you guys opposed to parents making a decision for their children's success? Because it sounds like you guys are opposed to that based on everything you can. You, you guys said it. You can nod your head because I heard it. I took notes. You guys are against it and you guys are speculating with a lot of things that are untrue. You, you, you said, we don't know. We don't know what's happening. And the final version is not out. So you guys are speculating a lot about what's not out there yet. Kind of, you know, confusing us to try and say, be well, I, to something. Let me respond to that. Right. Part of that is because we've been asking these questions. So. Sure. You're saying it's speculation. It's these are quite, no, I'm answering your question. We have been asking these questions of the State Board of Education for months. And they made changes, but they did not answer the questions. That's why we're bringing up transportation. That's why we're bringing up issues in terms of funding. Um, that's why we're bringing up issues in terms of safety, in terms of background checks. Those questions have not been answered. I mean, there's children at 16 that work at Wendy's and McDonald's. There's internships that happen. But that's you their guys choice. You're saying that, it, that children that should succeed where they're making network, uh, uh, you know, they're networking with a company and potentially do a career at that company for 20 plus years, you're, you're throwing a background check or your scare tactics to kind of turn people off from that. But there's kids doing internships right now. You have kids, I mean, people here that have done, I've done internships at 18. There's kids working okay, you're right at, now you're, at you're twisting our words. I'm not using We're not saying, words. no, we're not saying that. And I understand for you, this is a political sir. thing. This is a non-political event. You said. I'm not twisting, you said it. I took notes. Okay. Well, not you particularly. It was well, then said, thank you for... It was said by the pen. I took notes. I'm not going to mention who said it, but Scare Texas should... We should you mentioned it's a nonpartisan panel. It should be. But he's right. Uh, Lottie did mention the presidential election, and, and he did mention that. And, and again, she mentioned the Democrat Party. This is nonpartisan. It's not about political party. It's about the children and the success. And in my opinion, being a Latino, I see success with the direction they're going. Obviously, we, we, we have questions. You have questions. Mm -hmm. I have questions. So let's let it play out. If there's something that doesn't work, I'm sure you, Carolyn and Lonnie, are going are gonna to voice your opinions and make changes. But don't speculate and, and do scare tactics, which it sounds like you guys are doing. No, well, I'm, I apologize if that's the way you feel. 
okay? But, a, well, letter. I said I apologize, okay? Sure. But a lot of the information that we're telling you, we have back, we have information, statistics to back up what we're saying. Like the graduation okay. rate being the lowest uh, in do, any other county? N n well, our statistics says, is so that. I'm trying to change that, and you guys are our, to that. Well, you're going to answer the, for me then? I will just, just let you talk. I mean, I would love to say that. Okay, but the reality is, is we have do documentation to substantiate what we're saying. Okay, and it's not just about this area, because we are talking about the entire state. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can send your child to any school that you choose to send them, because now you can use the voucher. But it was not just here recently, it's been for a good while. But many of those children who were using those vouchers, who were using them to go to virtual schools and things like that, those schools were failing. Yeah, were and the state had to policies. and the state had to come in and close them down too. Mm -hmm. No, they were the okay, they we're, were hold on a second, hold on a second. We're getting way off topic. Let's move this is about the diploma. Right. Let's move back and now get into political arguments here. Um, here's a question which is a good question. This is a very good question. And we have not discussed this yet. Yet, how does this apply to students in special ed? Thank you. That's a great Thank question. It is. So, here's what we know, what we don't know. So, every special ed student's um, graduation or their ability to graduate will based on their individualized right. education program, right. their plan. So, what is in their plan will align with the diploma um, graduation requirement. So, there are some things that a student will be able to do that's on the, the new diploma, mm -hmm. and there are some metrics they won't meet based on their ability or disability. Um, so they won't be negatively impacted either which way. Just as right now, if a student has an IEP, mm -hmm. they will still graduate with the diploma, and that's based on the successful attainment of their goals and their plan. Does anyone want to add anything else? He basically said the same thing I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question. How will we clear all people's background who will be around our children? That's one of the questions. There's nothing in place that requires a business, a company, an organization to do any sort of background checks. Right. So that's when we talk about some of the concerns we have. That's one of the concerns we have is whom are your children going to be around? Right. And we don't know if it's going to be a completely safe environment. And they might not. opt not to be uh, an apprentice or workplace <clears throat> because that might impact their their yeah. day to day. Right. They might say, never mind, I don't want to do that if I have to be mandated mm -hmm. to exactly. have. Exactly. That's a good question. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, will small businesses be able to work? Uh, will be work sites, churches, community organizations. I think I'm saying that correctly. Is that asking if churches and community organizations will be work sites? I don't know. The, the question is, is whether or not smaller businesses, whether community organizations, whether churches, will also be involved in the community to be work sites. We don't know. Well, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, I think that earlier I talked about all the relationships that you have to cultivate in order to provide experiences. So, for example, we have a career pathway called digital design. What does that apprenticeship look like in action? So that might be, if I use an example, well, we, have, we need someone to design our weekly church bulletins or our programs. Can a student be, have an apprenticeship in that? Will it be 100 hours? Maybe not 100 hours. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's 20 or 30. But just all the opportunities that students can have access to might be something that, as each career pathway starts to look at what apprenticeship <coughs> looks like and what work-based learning looks like, that's when we start to have these conversations to say, here's what we need, here's what we have. Right. I can um, also add to that that there are conversations happening with um, the Center for Workforce Innovation. Mm -hmm. So I know our team is part of their um, the grant that they recently received to help students um, have those experiences on the employment side, so it's career coaching and things. So we're in conversations, and it was about uh, just, this was not part of the conversation, like, okay, we're gonna help them get to this, uh, like when we started the grant, like, was it like six months ago or something? But we are in conversations with the Center for Workforce Innovations 
um, at the college level to kind of help in this employment area and experiences. Okay. Um, when, Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say when we had conversations with them, we asked them, would this be a situation where a student would have to stay at this one particular location for 100 hours, or would they be able to go different places and get maybe, let's say, 20 hours here, 20 hours there? Because as, I, as we have already discussed, at 15, 16 years old, you may start off thinking you want to do something at one thing, and then later on you change, you want to do something else. So would they be locked into this one particular um, field of uh, employment, or could they do different things? And we weren't able to get an answer for that. And then we have only the funding part is the issue. I'm not sure if that's a question asking if funding is the only issue or what particularly the question is. Employment training is optional. Why does this panel continue to use scare tactics as if this is mandatory? All right, so we've already expressed we're not doing scare tactics. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not doing scare tactics. We are providing information and providing an opportunity for people to ask questions about it, about what's going on. We're sharing what we know. We want to make sure that people know this is what's on the table. It does not mean that this is the final version. But this is what we're sitting right now, and that you have the opportunity to provide public comment. So we're giving you facts. We're giving you information. We're not trying to scare you. Um, I can tell you from my own personal experience, I worked in education for a long time, and a big part of what I talked to students about was careers, getting them ready for careers. Whatever that path was, if it was going into training, whether it was going into uh, university, getting a, a certificate, a two-year degree, a four-year degree, whatever it was. So um, I understand there's some political relevance to this question, but we are not trying to scare people. Well, there's not a political relevance. So <clears throat> the problem is that you're having a hard time wanting to answer the question on a factual basis. That is your opinion, sir. That is not an opinion. And the fact is, what we told fact. you is there's it's information that is not concrete. Sir. Continue to For everyone's information, this is my opponent. That's so right. you've made it into you made this into a political issue. This is not a political issue. Okay. This is not in legislation. Yeah, this is not this in is, legislation, it, sir. Sir, made this is sir. This is not in legislation. This is what is no, proposed. This, this is what, excuse me, excuse me, this is what is proposed, and it is in black and white. And at this point in time, what we're trying to do is let everybody know that now is the time to let your voice be heard so that if there are changes that you need to make or you would like to see being made, now is the time. I can't what? I'm sorry. Yes. Thank Absolutely. I have no problem with whatever they're doing down the state because if we don't do anything, the problem is if we don't fight for our children, then who will? Your legislation, but if we don't get down there and support you, then we can't say anything about what's happening. And no offense, it's not about who's running against who. It's not that. It's about. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're supposed to be the bigger person. We're, right, we're talking about our children. Our children's future is at risk. Exactly. I, don't, I don't know about anybody. I don't know where you live. I don't really I care. Live in Chicago. But okay, so then I don't care what, what school your child goes to. All I know is this is affecting the whole state of Indiana. Exactly. What can we do as a community, as school board members, as teachers, as principals, as superintendents to go down here and help fight this? It's not just about just one city. It's about a whole state. state. Yeah. Exactly. So if we come together at, at one, just at one, at one, to go down state and help the ISBA, Indiana School Board Association, lobby and go to committee meetings to help get this thing redone, revised, or whatever before it starts or goes into effect, before it's actually legislation. 
That's all I'm saying. Right. I don't, have, I don't care about all of this other stuff. I care about my kids graduating. Absolutely. And I care about, I care about, I don't care about Thank you. I don't care about that. Thank That's what's you. important to me. And that I wouldn't you. be on the school board if I wouldn't be fighting for my kids. And so all this other right. stuff, we're not going to go back and forth with that because I'm not to tolerate it. And I don't think anybody else here came to tolerate all of this. Thank we're you. all this back and forth. We're here to talk about what can we do about this. That's my superintendent right there. Our kids are failing because they continue to keep changing the curriculum. Thank they you. They keep changing this, they keep changing that. Exactly. They're not giving any money. They just, they just and said, and that was, they just that's, said that's right. Two years ago that they okay, gave money for CTE they programs. Okay, so what about that? That's, okay, that's I'm, why I I'm stated sorry. earlier, I've been in the legislature for six years, and every other year, things change. And when they change, you've got school districts who have bought materials for their students, paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for them, and they cannot use them anymore. So now they got to take money and go and buy a different set of curriculums. They can't even sell them to another school in the district because they can't use it either. Okay, that's why we are here today to, to, to give you what is already in black and white, what was discussed as to what the plans were going to be last month so that you can see in black and white, this is what the plan is. And when we said we don't like it, okay, this is not representative of all the schools and all the students in the state. Because many school students want to go to college. They cannot get in any college with a curriculum like this. Okay? They cannot get in any school in the state of Indiana with this. They came and they spoke and they said this. That's why we're letting you know so that you can make your decision as to what you want to do. We're not trying to force you to do anything. We're just providing you the black and white. Well, you want to hear the truth. So I want to hear what they got to say. You want to hear the truth. I didn't see your picture on the flag. I want to hear what they got to say. So thank you for your call. Thank you. What, what we are here doing is sharing information. Excuse me, sir. Sir, sir, excuse me. What we're doing is sharing information and allowing, sharing what we know, sharing the process, okay. talking about where this is going, and allowing you to know what options you have in terms of feedback. And so we're going to get back to the questions. And in fact, one of the questions here received is, who specifically should be contacted at the State Board of Education? Um, the entire State Board of Education, Dr. Jenner, who is over education for the state, at some point they will open up, we presume, because this is what happened before, will have open up for public feedback and possibly have a forum as they did before. But that doesn't mean that just because that hasn't officially been announced does not mean that you cannot reach out now. So if you right. have concerns or questions, as I've said here, some of these are questions. It's not just saying this is concrete. It's things that we had concerns about with the first option. And all those questions did not get answered with the new option. Exactly. So those are questions we have and concerns we have, which we have voiced here and expressing, because that's what we should do. We shouldn't just keep to ourselves what our concerns are. Right. If these questions and concerns are resolved, no one will be happier than us. So um, that answers that question. Next question is, what about extracurricular art funding, language classes? <laughs> what about English language learners? I think that's probably a question for me. That is okay. here, sir. Uh, so we want to be very mindful that the new diploma <clears throat> rec proposal does require different resources in terms of personnel. So if you look at um, one of the sides, it does say there's going to be increase in personalized electives, and those electives are in CTE and world languages, et cetera. So in case anyone doesn't know, we are very much aware that there's a teacher shortage. Yep. So with this proposed legislation, how are we going to hire and find the teachers who are going to support these additional electives? And with that, what is going to be impacted? And so once again, qualified, certified teachers in these delivering um, elective instruction is critical. And where do we find those teachers to staff those classes? And I'll add on to that, um, under the enrollment seal, of course, I'll, uh, 
college enrollment, that's where my specialty lies. Right. Uh, we want to make sure that there are resources to help students get six college credits, right? And so are they doing that here or at, at the high school? Are they doing it on campus? And what's the funding for that? Because schools struggle with bus transportation mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. to um, colleges, yep. right? And so how are we going to deliver that? So that would be a question that I would uh, be asking, how are they gonna get that? Um, the other one is the uh, Indiana College Corps. So it says mm -hmm. under uh, the Honors Plus seal, right. that the, earn the, the Honors Enrollment seal plus, Indiana College Corps is another one of those um, requirements. Requirement. And so how are we going to deliver that? We have Ivy Tech, um, Purdue, Northwest and IU, we do offer Indiana College Corps, right. but we need more conversations because that does still cost, right. Uh, right? Because if we're gonna deliver those courses on campus, there's a cost. If you deliver those courses on campus, there is some other additional cost. Right. So we need to have a lot of conversations, and, and, and as Absolutely. I walked into the room tonight and met my colleague here and said, hey, we wanna talk, we wanna partner, and we wanna do what we can to help mm -hmm. our students be successful. Right. I will say that um, Indiana University has been increasing its retention rate of students and students right. of color. Right. Uh, we have been doing that. We are now uh, in the high 60s, almost 66% or 67% uh, retaining our students of color. That is very important um, to you and to us, right? And we have, uh, Indiana University has started to understand how to educate students. When we were really on this uh, mm -hmm. core 40, we got it down. Right. Uh, to now where, where our retention rate is up to 70% uh, right. for all students because right. we understood where our students were as far mm -hmm. as all the courses that right. they had and here's how we're going to work with our with our local schools. Right. And so we've been doing that work and doing, uh, doing that very well. And so for us, I know a lot of questions have been uh, really in that employment, in that employment mm -hmm. space and that's right, you've got questions on that. And then also what I'm saying is let's talk about the resources that are going to come to not to the schools, the high schools, right. in order to deliver um, these extra courses if students want right. to go on to college. Right. Right. And, and we also have to look at the fact that this is something that has to be a, something that can be obtained mm -hmm. by all schools throughout the state. Not just the schools that's located in this area or that area, but all schools within the state. All schools districts have to meet these same qualifications. And if it is not written in such a way that all <coughs> children can equally be able to obtain these different degrees, I mean d different diplomas, then it's a problem. All right, next question. Can you clarify if the employment path does not prioritize world language requirements, i.e. Spanish, especially given that the East Chicago School District has a significant Latino population? Yes. It raises concerns about whether local businesses, corporations are adequately prepared to serve our Latino community. Um, that's an issue. If your concern is Spanish speaking and anyone there mm -hmm. at an organization, at a business that speaks Spanish, there's nothing in the requirements that require that. Hopefully there are, mm -hmm. but again, there's nothing that requires that a business or an organization has certain languages spoken or by uh, their employees. Right. That step goes back to that initial statement around cultivating these partnerships and relationships mm -hmm. so that we have field and work-based learning experiences that are gonna meet the needs of all of our students. Absolutely. Correct. Um, what are, the superintendent, this is, this is for you, what are the teachers' role in this? And what is being said? I believe it's okay asked. Or asked. Or asked. Oh, sorry. Or asked. Okay. Uh, so the teacher's role still needs to be clarified. So obviously this um, proposal um, directly impacts our counselors. Um, but we want to be in mind, and I'll just point out one example. So the reduction of, our, of the health PE requirement reduces the need or the the number of PE courses that we have to have. On one end, we have to still encourage our students because I've, obviously we have issues with the wellness for our students. So what we don't want to do is reduce the amount of times where they are doing being physically active. Um, 
and so it doesn't mean that we're going to have fewer PE teachers. We still need to inc um, encourage the use of physical activity and physical exercise, whether it's in sports, et cetera. But for example, as a teacher, what do I do? You know, so I'm also concerned about, when we talked about resources and personnel, our teachers, and, and so if you can sort of look visionary, look at what does that look like? So I teach six classes, and in one of my classes, I'm supervising a caseload of students who are work-based experiences because I don't have enough students in all of my sections, so by default, here's, how, here's what my seventh class looks like. Right. Or virtue of the fact that we need that level of manpower to supervise all of these students or make sure they're going where they need to be going. So we don't know what that role is going to look like yet for a teacher, but those are conversations we have to have. Anyone want to add anything else on that? Good. No? All right. Any other questions? We have about 14 minutes left. How will our overwhelmed school counselors be expected to take on the role of finding job for students? You know, that's a good question. As mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, uh, we have a school counselor shortage as it is. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to put a lot, uh, that's going to put some additional strain on our school counselors. The hope is, is that companies will be there and that everything will be done correctly, but it's too early to know that. We don't know that yet. Right. So that's our hope is that this is actually an easier process on our school staff. But until we get a little bit closer and until we know what the final rule on this is and how the final structure is, we're in a little bit of a hold mode on that. And that's those resource <coughs> challenges again. So. In, uh, if you look for, in the next three or four years, does that mean that there is some role or multiple roles that is the freshman work, um, well maybe not freshman, sophomore work-based um, learning mm -hmm. coordinator, there's a junior work, and there's a senior level, because they have to support the counselors. Right. And maybe that's not just falls on the counselor, that's some other role, which means that's a teacher position less that I have to allocate for this, right. where we talk about the funding again. Mm -hmm. But if we say it's just going to be all on the counselors, I'm going to have, going to have a counselor shortage. Right. <laughs> I had the opportunity to go to a school and to talk to uh, one of the counselors. And this was a couple of years ago. This was last year, I want to say. And her concern was, in fact, she wrote me a very long letter because her concern was she was already overworked. Mm -hmm. And in the job of being a counselor, they had to document so many <clears throat> things. And it was so much paperwork that it was just overwhelming. And then with, them have, with her having five or 600 students, mm -hmm. and then if this should come, up, come to be, it would be really a burden. And one of the things that I know would relieve it was this um, Century 21 that went through because a lot of children who would qualify and could get the Century 21 scholars, they were being lost because the counselors did not have enough time to meet with each one of these students in order to get them signed up for the um, Century 21 scholars. So therefore, that alleviated some of the burdens, but it still did not alleviate the majority of them. So with this program, should it come to be, a lot has to be decided. And my guess, based upon that conversation I had with that counselor, they would need to hire at least one or two people to assist in getting it done, which would mean that school district would be responsible for two additional jobs, two additional two additional full-time jobs, I'm sorry, and, to, and uh, two additional salaries. And there's a, the American Association of School Counselors recommends a really good ratio. If you're going to be a counselor, you should have somewhere between 250 or mm -hmm. 300 counselees in order to be an effective counselor, mm -hmm. in order to offer effective guidance. Mm -hmm. If our numbers are exorbitant and on top of the other graduation requirements we have to monitor. Mm -hmm. Are our students going to get really effective counseling or they're going to be like, hey, here's your 200, here's your 100 hours, check it off, take this course, take this course, and then they keep, they run them out their office. Right. Which, is, which leads to really poor post-secondary preparation. Absolutely. All right. 
how do we plan to help parents navigate this new system so they, they can be involved and help their kids? That's you think, on me. I think that's on you. I yeah, think, or you can ask on, me. Be. I think that's going to be on both of us, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, as when the core 40, I go back to that because when the core 40 rolled out, it was <clears> both of us that were trying to communicate with the parents and mm -hmm. bring them along because you have parents that are super engaged like you are and then you have parents that aren't as engaged. Right. And so we have to find those different ways to communicate and get the information out. It's multimedia, it's multi-platforms uh, to get the information out, but it's definitely a partnership because it should, it, it should not be all on you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think our, our, our parents who are most successful are our informed parents. Mm -hmm. So how do we communicate the changes? How do you communicate our graduation requirements in general? Um, so it doesn't just happen to them. Mm -hmm. It is something they're part of. There is this monitoring piece that lets students know they're on track for graduation. They're off track for graduation. What are the interventions in place to make sure that they stay on track for graduation? What conversations do we already have and we sustain so parents know, hey, your student is on track for graduation. Your student is behind 50 hours. You know, when does that those conversations start to happen? Right. Yeah. I know oh, in, in Hammond some years ago when uh, the, the uh, 40 program came about, what they did was they held meetings mm -hmm. and invited the parents to come so they could explain to the parents what was required, what was happen. getting ready to happen, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. But um, I see that that would have to happen with this mm -hmm. because if you, the parents are knowledgeable, then they would be able to assist to make sure that those children are on the right track in order to receive whatever kind of diploma that they are seeking. And I would tell you some of the conversations I've had with education people have talked about the vital role mm -hmm. of the communication between parents and students mm -hmm. and that that's going to be a necessity. Um, and engagement is going to be a big part of this. So we thank you for being here. This is going to be our last question because we're almost out of time. Is it possible under the proposed changes that we will have students graduating who will not have the required credits to get into college Example, if a student graduates with enlistment and service seal, completes or leaves active service, and then decides to go to college, will they be able to? So I, you will probably <clears throat> hear me say, or use the phrase, both and. If we have our counselors who are having really effective guidance conversations with our students, and who are monitoring the accumulation of credits and are doing credit audits every semester, every end of the school year. That is one way we keep our students on track. The other piece is encouraging our students to not just do what we call the minimum. Mm -hmm. So if there's a student says like, oh, I only need to have 42 credits. Mm -hmm. We do a disservice to our students if we're having those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. So we say, hey, we know you're interested in more than one career pathway. You do have the space to do three or four credits here and three or four credits here. So that they're not just saying, well, I was only interested in doing this career pathway and now I wasn't successful. So there's nothing else for them to sort of not glom onto. So they end up saying, okay, well, I'm going to have to now def default to a, a different pathway or a different um, seal. So those are questions we have when we have really good, when our counselors have time to have those types of conversations. And so part of them having that time is making sure that they have appropriate caseloads to have these types of conversations with. So that our students aren't graduating with a diploma and they're ill-equipped to go and to do enrollment or ill-equipped even to do employment. Do you want anything? Nope. nope. All right, in our last few minutes, if you don't mind, we'll start with Dr. Frank. Um, any last comments or words of advice? Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, no. um, just know that the colleges, I, I'm pretty sure all of us will be working together with the high schools mm -hmm. to make sure that we all understand it and that it's a good solution or the best solution. And let me just say this, that if it's not 
the best solution. I think we're going to work together to make it the best solution for the students as much as possible. They are the focus of all of this. The communication and the partnership is going to be very vital between the state colleges or private colleges and, and, the, and the local schools. It's going to be important. I think the diploma presents an opportunity for us to look at how we support our students, how do we provide intervention, how do we partner with needed resources so that our students are graduating. And that diploma, whether it's employment, enlistment, or enrollment, that diploma means that I am prepared to be successful post-secondarily, regardless of whatever path. And that's what that has to mean. And that's where we need our parents, and we need our legislators and our elected officials, where we need our university partners and our industry partners to do that. Okay. <clears throat> My last thoughts are, we get one opportunity to raise our children. And I feel that this is a basic meeting where you have learned and you've gotten information as to what's coming down the pipe. Whether it's something you like or whether it's something you don't like. Now you have a chance to let your voices be heard. You can contact the Indiana State Board Association. You can write them a letter. You can make a phone call or whatever you need to do in order to let them know your feelings because one opportunity, and if you don't make your voice be heard now, and something happens down the way that you aren't happy with, then it's nothing that you're going to be able to do then. So I just encourage you to take this information you have, <clears throat> go home, read over it, and make your own decision with your family. Talk to your children, make your own decision as to what you feel is important. First thing I want to say, um, Diane, thank you for getting us back on track. And I apologize for any role I played in us getting off track. I have, uh, I worked in public education for a long time. I mentioned that earlier. I am a big believer that we as a state should do whatever we can to make sure that our young people, when they graduate high school, they are able to continue down whatever that successful path is. If it's a certificate, training, two-year degree, four-year degree, whatever it is, I think we need to do that. I think we need to work hard to make sure our young people are successful. Um, what, and, and that's been something I've been involved with for a long time, even before being a legislature, legislator, in terms of mentoring young people and helping them continue on with their career. What we, our goal today, as mentioned earlier, is to share information. Here's what happened, here's what, started this process, which was legislation. Here's the first version. It went through changes. We're now sitting at the second version. And there's an opportunity for you, all of you, and even people that aren't here that you may speak with later to be engaged in this process. As mentioned, the State Board of Education has not officially opened up a public comment period. We expect that they will. They have to have this finalized by December 30th of this year. So, and this was one of the questions on there, a little bit more detailed information in terms of whom you can reach out to. On the bottom of this sheet, there is an email for the IDOE liaison. Mm -hmm. So even though public comment has not happened, you can provide comment. There's also a QR code to scan, or to, you can scan to view the members mm -hmm. of the Indiana State right. Board of Education. And again, I'm gonna repeat. This is where we are now. What we have brought up are some of the concerns and questions. Some of those were not answered, not rectified from the first version to the second, and so those are out there. Um, so we wanna make sure that everyone knows what they are. My hope is everything gets resolved, and again, what is best for, and this has been said, what is best for our young people is what happens. But you have to have information so you know the situation so that you can get engaged and involved in the process. So that's why we decided to have this town hall, was to make sure that people know what's going on and what they can do. You are, whether you are a superintendent, a university, a legislator like us, 
uh, school board member, candidate, parent, staff, whatever you are, uh, university staff, sorry, I didn't want to leave you out, you can get engaged in this process, and that's a big thing for me is always preaching engagement. Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything I agree, but please stay engaged and be involved in the process. So I hope we've answered some questions. I understand there's some questions we can't answer because we don't have answers to them, but hopefully we've given you some other things to think about and helped you look at what's going on with the education of our students and hopefully get involved and engaged in that process. So um, out of respect for time, we're at 7 o'clock. Thank you again for being here. Appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you and talk to you about what's going on. Thank you very much, everybody. All right.